everyone. Welcome to the 225th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And we have got a packed show for you today. We're going to be talking about misgivings on Google and Amazon Echoes. Plus, Eslo is buying Citrulite. We'll give you an update on where all that is. And Intel has some new chips worth talking about, and ARM has a new licensing strategy. I'm going to give you an update on those wise bulbs we talked about and discuss a new wise product that was leaked. Plus, we're going to talk about some news bits, including updates to drones, funding for IoT satellites, and a Bluetooth extender for Eve. And because it is a day that ends in Y, we've got a security story. We'll also hear from our sponsor, Dell Technologies, talking about retail. And our guest this week is... Rags Srinivasan of Seagate. He is talking about how Seagate has implemented AI and cameras to improve their manufacturing process. It's a really great interview. He really does a great job explaining how they did this and why they made the decisions they did. And anybody who's trying to implement any sort of IoT or computing at the edge should really listen to it. So all of this coming up. But first a message from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is a Faro. Are you doing multiple IoT projects that work well together in a single app that strengthens your brand? That's really hard and it requires the right platform. With a Faro, Kenmore launched 42 smart appliance models in just two years. A Faro customers have experienced as much as an 80% reduction in time to market, 99% fewer support calls, and a 10x higher activation rate. Plus, they can reuse 90% of their work from one project to the next. Pick a Faro, like Kenmore, Mitsubishi Bank, and D-Link did, and beat your competition with a solution that your team loves to build and your customers love to use. Learn more at afaro.io slash go big. Okay, Kevin, right after we recorded the show last week, we heard big news from, it was a Belgian news site, right? A journalist at with VRT, a Belgian broadcaster, brought the news. Uh, it's rather scary, and I guess we shouldn't be surprised by this because smart speakers, we know they listen to us. But what happens after that? We're finding out more. Uh, Google is saving all of those voice recordings and using contractors to transcribe them, which I suppose that's to improve the voice results, right? Right. They're using it to make sure everything's correct. But what was shocking to me was I had read in, I want to say it was a CNET article, when Amazon had the same story come out about them, probably a month ago, Google said that they actually used voice modulation so people couldn't understand or identify the voices. And this is proving that completely wrong. So I'm like, oh, that's really sad, because I really thought that was a good thing for Google to be doing. Yeah, it's that was probably one of the I shouldn't laugh at it, but one of the funniest things in this in this article that came from VRT. We let ordinary Flemish people hear some of their own recordings, it says, and here's a quote. This is undeniably my own voice, says one man, clearly surprised. Yeah. And the big thing for me isn't that Google or Amazon annotates and has to pick up real recordings and make sure and check it for accuracy. I feel like that has to happen. It makes sense that that happens. I would like to see anybody who's doing this and sending it on to contractors to actually modulate people's voices. So that's not recognizable. Granted, there still will be identifiable information if there's addresses and stuff in there. But what really caught my eye here and made me really uncomfortable was the false positives. So VRT had over a thousand recordings, and of that, 153 were triggered without someone saying the words, hey, G, I don't want to say the words and trigger yours. Right, the wake words. So that is a incredible false positive rate. That's, you know, 15% at its highest, but we don't actually know what more than a thousand is. It's less than 2,000, but more than 1,000. That's too high. 
It is. And you'd think at this point, considering all the breakthrough analysis and theory and technology and math that Google has been applying to its NLP, you would think they wouldn't have that high of a false positive rate by now. Yeah. Well, you would think that. And I remember someone from Google talking about using AI in smart homes and using AI to to automate things. And he talked about the false positive rates. And for something to actually automatically happen, they wanted to see a false positive rate of like 1% for it to take action. Now, privacy is not the same as like ordering a pizza if you think someone's I think if you think someone wants a pizza. But I would like to see privacy move up in their esteem or rankings. So maybe your false positive rate is more like, I don't know, 5%. That's still pretty high. But to me, it makes up for the inconvenience if you... So what I I, I guess, it's time to stop talking about things like, ah, this is a violation of our privacy. And I think it's time to actually talk about what we should see happen. So I already Mm -hmm. mentioned voice modulation. I would also like to see audits of these, public audits. Independent, yes. Yeah, independent public audits. Worst case scenario, I would like to see Google publish their false positive rate and Mm. probably publish the percent of recordings that are sent to contractors. This gives people information that could really help them decide. Because right now it's like, (gasps) and they should say where those contractors are. And these in the story, these contractors were actually local to the area where the recordings were, where the speakers were. It's not like they're, in this case, they weren't farmed around the world. They were localized. And I should say, I was a contractor for Google for 18 months, and I had to sign all the same NDAs and all that. Just in my case, I I presume that's standard practice there, just to give people that information. Sure. Google is really pissed. Google's Google's line is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But these guys broke broke our NDA. And I'm like, Google, <laughs> they did. But what you're doing here isn't exactly right. And I know a lot of people are saying, hey, this is how these things work. And I agree with that. Mm. <laughs> that doesn't mean they have to be that way. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that that's, that particular false positive rate is okay, or that you know, you shouldn't take steps to preserve people's privacy in the when you're using real contractors and not just AI. Kind of related to this, actually very related to this and very timely. How does Amazon actually check the recordings? Well, they give you the option in the app to basically say, hey, I heard this. You know, Madame A says that. Is this what you meant? Is it, Did I do the right thing? Right. So in a sense, we all help train or can at least. I bet most people don't go in there and do this, but we all help Madame A. The funny thing is, and this story broke last week, over the weekend, and in fact, just yesterday, I got the Google Assistant pop up on my screen on my Chromebook and said, hey, please rate that last voice command. And I had actually set a command to my Google home device, my smart display to raise the volume. I was listening to Spotify and it gave me a ranking and then I could leave a comment as well. So I had never seen that before this story. Coincidence? Maybe? It is. I'm wondering. I've seen you it You think before. so? How recently? Oh gosh, I don't know. Time is like a river for me. It flows and flows. Because I'm on these devices all day long and it's built into my Chromebook and I have all the displays. I've never seen it. Maybe they don't care about your opinion. Maybe they only care about my opinion. I don't blame them. (laughs) They're like, he obviously doesn't work here anymore for a reason. Let's not even bother with this guy. Yes. So I will say, (laughs) given this news and the lack of, for me, it was the false positives, the lack of protection here. Does this change your comfort level with having these around your house? Is the convenience still worth it to you? Well, it's funny you say that because I'm I'm not having a change of heart in things because I've always just put myself out there with all these devices and sensors and social networks. But over the past couple of weeks, I have been rethinking everything as more and more of these types of privacy intrusions and data packs and things go into, you know, up here. I'm probably not going to change the way I use these devices, but I think I'm a little more aware of basically maybe what I want to say and what I don't at times. And that sounds silly because I'm in my own home and I should be able to say what I want. 
Uh, yeah. Well, here, let me tell you. So there's some options for people who still want to use these, and they range from like, you probably should do this to, wow, this is pretty extreme. So first option is you can switch off recording for Google devices, and you just go into your Google account in web and app activity. You can manage your activity and controls, and there's a section called voice and audio activity, and you can pause that. So I have mine paused, and that means it doesn't make recordings of my voice, so it can't send those on to people, right? Mm -hmm. That does mean I'm not helping Google. But I did turn that off a while back. So anyone can do that. You can always go and delete your old recordings as well. And so those will be gone. And going forward, if you're really uncomfortable, you can turn off the microphone on your Google devices and on your Amazon devices. And then it won't be listening. Yeah, and then it won't be listening. But then it also, when you shout across the room to it, for it to do something, it's not going to do it. Right. To be honest, I've actually done that a little more than I used to do as of late. Oh. Like if I'm not going to be actively wanting to have Google do something for me here at my office, for example, like if I know I just want peace and quiet, I'm not going to want music. I don't care if somebody comes to the doorbell, even though it will still show me that it may not announce it or anything. I have the mic off. If I know I'm going to be changing music and, you know, maybe want to ask Google some questions, I turn it back on. Okay. You know, additionally, again, my Chromebook has Google Assistant built in. There's an option if you have a Chromebook that has this support, you can, in the settings, you can have it on for always listening or not always listening, which is effectively shutting off the the microphone from listening all the time. And instead, there's a Google Assistant key that you can hit to, and you know, basically take the place of a a wake word. Ooh, that's exciting. Because if you're working at your desk, you mm-hmm. could leave the mic on the device off and then just boom. All right. Yeah. In theory, I could still change things, uh, music and whatnot. So um, there are options. And we should probably mention, only because we talked about it last week, I believe, the Google Home Local SDK is now available for developers. And what that should do is not send, I think, you shouldn't send any recordings to the cloud because it's all going to happen. All the language should happen on the device. Yes. We'll see how that actually works in practice. Exactly. But we're looking forward to that. All right. Yes. Moving on. This week, big news in the, I'm going to call it the pro and even sort of the DIY smart home front, which is a company called Eslo has bought the assets of Centralite. Probably back in, I don't know, was it April? We talked about Centralite had filed for bankruptcy and Centralite made a bunch of sensors. They made a bunch of Zigbee sensors and I think maybe, did they make Z-Wave sensors? They did, yeah. Zigbee and Z-Wave. Yep. So they made a bunch of sensors. They were lovely. Um, they'd been in the world for a long time and all of a sudden they went bankrupt. So Eslo has bought that. However, I had an email conversation with James Busby, who is the one of the founders of Centralite, the original Centralite, just to check in on where things were. And he says that he's forming a company to support old Centralite projects and to repair and sell spare parts. So hopefully, if you've got a legacy system, you can still... I guess, service that. And you can find that at www.centralitesupport.com. And he's hoping that after all of this goes down, he'll be able to make new products as well. And so it could be another company that is going to develop new IoT products. That's a rather smart move on his part, because usually when these companies go under, that's it. You know, they're, they're done, people move on, products are bought, acquired, etc. But to support the potential for older devices now. You don't see that happen too often. Yeah, you really don't. And I should add that Eslo, they actually acquired a company called Mios. That was a smart home services platform that made the Vera Z-Wave products. And they also, in October of last year, purchased a company called Fortress, which was a leak detection and flood prevention product. So Eslo is probably a company that we're going to see more of in the near term. Okay, You want to talk about chips? I think so. Oh, Kevin, this is exciting chip news. It is. You're you're the chip girl. I mean, I I like 
having chips, but you really get into, and I mean really get into chips. I do. So Intel announced a new chip that mimics brain computing. And why does this matter? Okay, long story short is we have reached we have reached the end of Moore's Law, which means we cannot pack more chips on a wafer. We cannot get the power advancements and the energy advancements that we used to get. So no more shrinkage. No more shrinkage. And this is a problem because now what are we going to do, right? We're going to try new architectures. So Intel's new architecture is Oh, here we go. These names, yeah. they're hard for me. We practice, we practice, but I don't know if we're going to pull this one off. All right. So Intel announced an 8 million neuron neuromorphic system that is comprised of 64 of what they call Loihi research chips. That mm-hmm. particular system is called Pohi. I'll do it. <laughs> po- <laughs> Pohoiki Beach. So all of this is on their Nahuka boards. So a lot of Hawaiian names here. I'm like, yeah. okay, sure. But what this is, is they've changed the architecture such that this particular chip can process information a thousand times faster and 10,000 times more efficiently than a CPU for certain applications. And some of those applications include mapping. So the kind of mapping that like your Roomba does in a room or the car does, something called sparse coding. I don't know what sparse coding is. Do you, Kevin? Well, I have a general idea. Remember, I'm only in my third semester here at Comp Side, but sparse learning is basically trying to take a lot of data into something and putting it into something uh, like a structure of, of, of maybe a dictionary, not the Webster's dictionary, but a, a dictionary in, in code. And what sparse learning should do is kind of represent the data with as few inputs as possible and without losing too much of what it really means, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. So if you have like a machine learning model that has to have like a gazillion data points, well, you need a lot of computing power to get through all of them. But if you can model that data in a dictionary with far fewer points accurately, you can run the compute far faster. Right. It's the equivalent of a glance versus a deep read. There you go. Ha ha! Okay, so Intel has announced this. If this is not something we expect to see used anytime truly soon. They are researching how to put this particular, the Loihi, on a USB stick. If they could do that, we would see something like what they did with the Movidius acquisition, where they put those they put those chips on a USB stick and allowed people to play with them as a developer options. So that would was that the video computer vision? It was. It was the computer vision chip acquisition. Right. Okay. So that's mm-hmm. kind of where I would expect to see this next. That's the the next thing I would see here. And if you're wondering, IBM has been working on neuromorphic computing. Other companies in the chip space have been working on this. This is kind of one of the next big things. But what's likely to happen is we're probably going to figure some jobs for this. And we're still going to have CPUs, we're still going to have GPUs, but basically we're going to have more architectures. So only because you mentioned neuromorphic and we've talked about architectures, the whole idea here, if I'm understanding it is, the architecture they're using is kind of to mimic the human brain with synapses and so on. Would that be accurate? Oh, yeah. The brain is the most efficient computer. And I remember as far back as like 2008, talking to people who were trying to mimic the brain. There's dozens of different ways to do this. A lot of them hit. It's both a complex computing problem, just designing this stuff and coding problem. So this is so far been promising, but it's not scalable yet by any stretch of the imagination. Take all of this with a grain of salt. But Speaking of chips, here's something that's actually real. ARM this week has announced a new licensing option. And I look at this and I am like, hoo hoo, ARM, you are, you are reacting to the threat that Risk Five promotes. Risk Five is an open source architecture for chips. But what ARM has decided is they have a new licensing strategy. So initially, if you want to build an ARM based chip, you license the architecture from them, and then you add stuff to it. So add stuff to their code and issue a chip. Or you can buy an architecture license, and that allows you to change 
the architecture a little bit. And so the big companies like Amazon, Apple, Qualcomm, Broadcom, et cetera, they all have architecture licenses so they can kind of tweak that a little bit more granularly. But what ARM is saying now is instead of licensing at the front end, you can actually get access to the license, design for a little bit, and then pay when you start taping out and sampling your chips. And this is a big change. Yeah. Well, this opens up access for a lot of smaller companies that maybe don't have the funds to to pay the current licensing terms, and therefore they can't even get into this market for their product ideas. So they can get in for a much cheaper price up front. And then, of course, in both cases, ARM charges a per unit royalty, but you you don't have to worry about that until you, until you start- Until you actually build the chip chips. And chip. Yeah, but here's my question. Okay. I assume that you, when you license these things, you have a, like some type of NDA or something. Like how much inside information on the ARM architecture you're going to have before you actually have to start paying? Oh, well, I think this is like any other license, which is now you can get everything you need to design a chip. And then when you mm -hmm. sell it is when you pay it. So I, I okay. think you get right. what you need. I mean, maybe there are secret keys. Someone else who works with this could tell us for manufacturing. And there are two things that matter here. One is what we just talked about with Intel, how we've hit the end of Moore's Law. We've got so many different applications out there as we've got chips, you know, that range from like supercomputing type jobs or cloud computing type jobs all the way down to like turning on and off a sensor. So ARM is hoping to take advantage of that and let other companies license this stuff to take advantage of that. And then the other thing is what I said about Risk V. They are seeing companies choose to use the Risk V architecture for things like IoT, and they don't want to lose that business. So that's that's what's happening here. Okay, chips gone. Let's talk about whys. Last week, I talked about the whys bulbs, and I said something that was wrong because I couldn't find it and Kevin couldn't find it. Nope. But the wise people could find it, and they told us about it. So when I talked about the wise bulbs, I said you could not tie it to the sense, or actually what I said is I could not find a way to tie it to the sensors, and that frustrated me. And wise let me know that there is a way to tie the bulbs, like turning them on and off to the sensors. The way you do that is you go into the home screen, and then you go into edit shortcuts. And then you have to create a shortcut. When you click on create a shortcut, you're going to pick your action. Your action is going to be a bulb. And then you're going to click on an automation or you're going to say automate. And then you're going to pick the sensor and then voila, you have it. Yeah, I, I'm glad it's there because it, it just didn't make sense to not have that functionality. Maybe it's just because I really don't have one wise product. I have one wise cam version two, so I don't have anything to connect it to. But even so, I was looking all around like, I can't find this thing. Yeah, I, I didn't love that. But as I said last week in the newsletter, I think this is designed for people who may not need or want all of that. It's so cheap, 30 bucks for eight bulbs. You know, people can just mm -hmm. buy this and play with an app and they may not want all this crazy stuff that you and I try to do. So True. the other wise news is there was a leak on the Home Depot site. Yes, and speaking of cheap... And Wise, not that their products are cheap, crappy products, they're cheap, good products. And Wise will be debuting a Wi Fi smart plug two pack, according to Home Depot's website. I'm looking at it right now, and it says $19.98 a package. So they've got uh, a two pack of these Wi Fi smart plugs. They are just single plugs. It's, some of them have two outlets. You know, they may take one outlet and turn it into two when you plug it in, but that's not the case. It's just a one for one outlet. Will work according to this with Madam A, Google, also scheduling. And as you just pointed out, you can automate the wise plug with wise sense based on open, close and motion detection. Again, according to this product website. Cool. All right. We'll look for that. All right. Tiny and news. It's Wi Fi. It is Wi Fi because it's got power. It makes sense. Wise only does their proprietary protocol for the sense devices because they're battery powered. Battery makes sense. So, all right, quick news bits, and we've got to run through these fast. So, let's go. Alphabet's Wing launches the Open Sky air traffic control platform for drones. Kevin. 
This is interesting, and, and it's already been in use in Australia. Uh, Alphabet's Wing group has got a post on Medium for people who want to see all the bits and details, but essentially, they've created Open Sky, which is a a method, a platform rather, to understand flight rules with buildings, roads, trees, and terrain, all the stuff that Google has in Google Maps. And the idea is to help drones navigate safely. You'll even get information like if your drone is flying too close to a restricted area uh, or there's an emergency in the area, you need to clear the air. So we'll see if people latch onto this open sky platform as it expands. All right. And my news is from ubiquity link which is a satellite it's an iot satellite player and they have raised 5.2 million in seed funding that brings their total funding to 12 million and this weekend they are going to do another satellite launch i wrote about this company a while back and basically they have built modules that allow devices to connect to their satellite network it's satellite, they don't have universal coverage yet. So what happens is like a couple times a day, the satellite will pass overhead and you will be able to send a little tiny message. They already have customers. So it's a big deal. And funding is going to be useful. Obviously, they have to launch and build all those small sats. So there we have it. Next up, Eve, the maker of HomeKit enabled Bluetooth sensors has announced a brand new BLE extender will be available in August in Europe for almost 50 euros, which is about $56 in the US. And this particular device basically extends your Bluetooth range. Yay, because I hate Bluetooth that is not Bluetooth mesh because it, (laughs) you know, if you go upstairs, you're like, "Ah, I can't control my lights anymore. So that device will work with Bluetooth accessories, and it will show you what's in range. It will pick which ones it wants to assign to Eve Extend, and yay. It seems like a good product for anyone who's all in on HomeKit and wants to add and make their sensor experience better. Finally, we've got our our sad security story of the day. Kevin? Yeah, we talked about this a while back, and and it sort of has been mitigated, but it's worth bringing up again. Uh, Medtronic, which makes uh, insulin pumps, they have uh, some older models that are still in use by people that essentially can easily be hacked. And Medtronic kind of fluffed it off and didn't say it's a big deal. So two researchers actually built an Android app to prove that it is a problem, basically saying, hey, this app, we know that we reverse engineered the frequency to the Medtronic pump, and we can send it commands to shut off somebody's insulin or spike their insulin or whatever, uh, basically saying we could kill somebody. They did this to spur Medtronic to do exactly what Medtronic has finally done. They've issued a recall, and they're going to replace those pumps, which is great. I'm not surprised by this because I actually, I know the frequency for that because I bought up a radio hat for a Raspberry Pi to send commands to a Medtronic, but we used it for good to uh, help automatically regulate insulin based on blood sugar readings for our our CS class. So good on these guys, more white hats uh, showing that these things need to be resolved. Yes. And initially, it would be awesome if these things didn't happen as much in the first place. But you know, that's tough. We're getting there. Yeah. Okay. I think now it is time for the Internet of Things podcast hotline. What do you say, Kevin? Absolutely. This week's podcast hotline is brought to you by Schlage. Schlage's wide variety of smart locks lets you create the smart home of your dreams. Learn more about Schlage's smart home solutions and compatibility with Amazon, Apple, and Google products at schlage.com slash IOT. Okay, y'all, if you call us Before the end of this month, you will be entered to win a Schlage Smart Lock. So give us a call, 512-623-7424, and you could be entered to win. And how cool would that be? This week's caller is, who is it? It's Steve. It's Steve. All right, this week's caller is Steve, who has a pressing question that I imagine a lot of us have. Let's hear it. Hey guys, my name is Steve. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I was recently outside grilling and I had an idea that it would be great if I could get a Madam A type object to uh, do communication between the devices I already have, which include a show, uh, a couple dots and a regular echo. 
and have something outside uh, in order to play music and communicate with my wife and kids inside. Uh, any suggestions or ideas you might have would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, Steve, we have pretty much bad news for you. <laughs> 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 the particular use case you're looking for, the drop-in, that is only something that can be found on Amazon Echo devices. No third parties. No third party. So any third party outdoor capable speaker isn't going to work for this. Sorry. But you can buy a third-party outdoor-capable speaker and plug the Amazon input into it. This is a $35 device. You will have to plug it in using the 3.5-millimeter headphone jack cable. So using that cable, plug that in. You're also going to have to plug it into power, and you probably shouldn't leave it outside. So right. is this awesome? Mm, not really. No. But if you can live without the calling and the drop in, I didn't know this until just this morning. You could get a Madam A speaker for outdoors that's um, water resistant and dust resistant, IP67 rated. Ultimate Ears makes the Blast, which is a small battery powered Wi Fi and Bluetooth speaker with Madam A built in. Again, because it's third party, you can't use the calling and the drop in, but at least you could, you know, listen to music outside, change it by voice, and so on and so forth. And I'm even wondering, maybe there's some skills out there, or you could use if this, then that to like send a text message to the family. There might be a way to do it, but natively, that's not going to work for you, even with the Ultimate Ears Blast. Or. You could just bring your smartphone outside and use the Metal May app. I know. That's true. It's not it's not sexy, it's not exciting, but if you really have to have drop in, just bring your phone with you. So, good news, bad news, couple options. I also looked for outdoor enclosures for the Amazon Echo devices. I didn't find anything that was worthwhile. Sorry, Steve. I feel like we, tried. we failed you, but it's not us. It's Amazon. Maybe it'll make an outdoor speaker. I imagine the reason it doesn't is because it doesn't want to give like control or something to somebody walking by to lean over the fence and be like, psst, Meadow May, unlock the door. Or That's what voice match is for. That's why it works so well. Is that on the Echo? Oh, it's uh, maybe, maybe it's not called voice match, but. Oh, I was like, I thought that was Google. But yes. It, okay. Yeah. Yes, you could do that. But be aware that if you leave one of these outside you are opening up a whole world of excitement to mischievous neighbors. So yeah. who know you have one. Alrighty. That concludes this portion of the show. Please stay tuned for our interview with Rags Srinivasan, who is from Seagate talking about Project Athena and how they helped improve their manufacturing process using IoT and AI. Before that, Let's hear from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Dell Technologies. Hey everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Dell Technologies, and I have Craig Wetzel, who is Director of IoT Channels at Intel, here to talk to you about their relationship with Dell. So what is on the horizon for Intel in the IoT space, and how do you see Dell engaging with Intel to bring that to market? Industries that are seeing the greatest benefits from IoT and edge computing enabled by AI include healthcare, manufacturing, retail, and smart cities. Take retail, for example. We see an interesting future in this area of interactive retail, and we've had quite a few engagements with Dell in the retail market. Together, we're exploring ways that we can turn those traditional retail interactions into more unique retail experiences. And we're doing this by leveraging the latest computer vision technologies from Intel, such as the OpenVINO Toolkit, which stands for Open Visual Inference and Neural Network Optimization. This toolkit allows for developers to innovate with deep learning inference at the edge, so we are deploying it across the different solutions and platforms that Dell offers. Let me give you an example. Imagine if a shopper could go to a retail location and the retailer could use various IoT technologies to identify that shopper and personalize their shopping experience. The retailer would be able to allow a customer to set up a shopping profile that could be accessed when the shopper entered the stores. Video could be used to identify that shopper as they entered and begin an interactive engagement. If that retailer for say is a clothing store, that history could include the shopper's clothing sizes, favorite colors, brand preferences, and accessories. They could then use this digital signage to guide the shopper to the area of the store where they would have the most interest. Use an interactive mirror 
to show the clothing in different colors, then utilize a real-time inventory system to deliver the chosen item to the shopper's home. If the item they wanted is out of stock, they could have it delivered to their home. Taking these types of analytics can revolutionize a traditional experience and bring a better process to the shopper and retailer. These types of solutions are easy to install with the breadth of products that Dell offers, from their servers to their Dell Edge gateways. Thank you, Craig. Any final thoughts or observations you'd like to speak to in regards to the Internet of Things? IoT is not an easy engagement. It requires multiple products woven together with the right applications installed in locations that are, in many times, challenging or harsh. No one company can do it alone. Dell and Intel, together with our strong ecosystem, are developing and deploying solutions across industries and driving results. For integrators and end users looking to see the benefits of IoT today, we have a selection of Intel IoT market-ready solutions and Intel IoT RFP-ready kits powered by Dell that are available to be deployed today. Check out these offerings as well as many others on DellTechnologies.com slash IoT. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's guest is Rags Sridevasan, who is Senior Director of Growth Verticals at Seagate. Hi Rags, how are you? Hi Stacey, I'm doing very well. How are you doing? I am super well, and I'm really excited because we met a couple months ago and you talked to me about bringing AI into your manufacturing plants over at Seagate, the wafer manufacturing plants. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about what that entails and the choices that you made around IoT and AI in your, your business operations. It's going to be a lot of fun. So first off, explain to people, most people know what Seagate does, but you may want to explain a little bit about how you do it and why you guys decided to update your manufacturing process. So most people know is from the drives. Most people uh, who run into me in the streets say, hey, I saw your drives at the Costco. It's, it's, that's how they know us. But also our drives run most of the cloud data centers everywhere. Like we produce about tens of millions of drives a quarter. So you look at the scale of what we are manufacturing. That's not a technology company with a lot of manufacturing behind it to produce 30 plus million units of drives every quarter and make sure they work. But then when you peel back inside the drive, it's truly an engineering miracle. Like it has multiple platters and drive heads all packed in such a small form factor. It's like a drive head floating over a spinning platter is the equivalent of like a 747 flying 700 times the speed of sound close to the ground. So it is every bit of it is complex and high position matters. And anything we can do there to improve the process, improve the productivity or the quality is going to have a direct impact on our business performance. So that's why we decided to take a careful look at our entire manufacturing process and take advantage of AI and IoT into the mix. So when you guys decided to upgrade your manufacturing process, what was your first insight or what was your first goal? When we started out, we started like most people. We, some of us, got in the room and started talking technology first. Like we looked at the IoT sensors, we looked at our entire manufacturing process across seven factories, the sensors on each one of those machinery, and got excited by what we see and hear about happening in the AI and started there. But very quickly we recognized, well, everything that we do or start with technology is not the direct answer to what we want to solve in terms of business impact. Also, all these projects, you can start out, bite off much bigger than you could when you begin with. So we also needed to scale back our ambitions. Look, every bit of this factory, you can put them in categorization of be it a simple uh, manufacturing predictive maintenance project, or it could be a quality improvement process. Where is it we want to start? That problem is reasonably hard enough that others have not done it as well as solving it will have a direct business impact. So we narrowed down the problem space to pick that one aspect, the drive head quality process. In the whole chain, the drive head manufacturing process has about 1,400 steps, takes about six months to complete. We thought like 
solving that one with AI and IoT will give us the biggest initial win that we wanted to show. And then from that scale back to the rest of the processes and then the rest of the factories. Awesome. So you guys basically said, hey, we could like do this low hanging predictive maintenance on our machines and maybe per- make our factories perform a little bit more efficiently. Or we could go big and say, hey, we're going to take this really intricate process and see how we can improve it and thus hopefully have a way bigger impact. That is exactly correct. And also we focus on the outcomes more. If you look at that, the commercials that you're seeing, the elevator salesman coming up before the elevator is down, those catches everyone's imagination very quickly. But what really matters is if we go down to the real hard numbers, like if I can predict a particular entity that we are making is going to be flawed before it goes through those 1,400 steps, that flows directly into our bottom line. So that was even more impactful. It may not catch the imagination outside to tell a bigger story, but it has a direct impact. So that's where we rolled back and started there. And yes, it has turned out to be a big enough problem for our data scientists to take on and solve as well. That's a really good thing. I mean, yes, no, I don't think anyone is like, yes, I want to make spinning platters and the the heads that read those more efficient is like the number one problem facing their production line. But for you, it makes sense. So how long did that process take? Just getting to like figuring out what you guys were going to do and what did you learn along the way in doing so? Yeah. So as we first did our initial set of brainstorming analysis, problem space reduction, if you will, that process took us about uh, three months or so, mainly because uh, we wanted to do a lot of things. We have very qualified, very smart minds, wanted to try a few things. And then what we brought in is like, I, I got involved with that team and we put a more of a structure around let's again focus on the priorities and then set ourselves a more aggressive goal starting from that point to do one thing. We're not going to promise to a much bigger across the board, but going to do it for one factory, one pilot. And then from that on, have a plan. How am I going to scale that from the one line in one factory to seven other factories worldwide? And the first thing also we did is we branded the project first. I mean, it's it's easier to go in and there and say like, hey, I'm going to do AI and everything. But after that, it loses the internal organizational attachment as well. So as a group, we branded this internally as Project Athena. That helped us create a rallying cry around the entire organization. We got the name out in front of the execs. We got the full exec buy-in to do this. And then we saw that everyone rallying around, let's hope to, or let's all work together to make Project Athena a success. And, we, and with that Project Athena, everyone was able to define what's part of it. We said in that this is about anomaly detection of wafer manufacturing from the where the wafers are cut into heads. And we're going to, this is about delivering the quality improvements, the throughput improvements, and overall reduction in the need for future investments. So all this came under the one common umbrella, and then everyone started speaking that language. It gave us enough of momentum that is needed to get going. And from then on to the completion, it was about 12, 15 months or so to complete the pilot. And then now we are in the process of taking this and then how it can become scalable and deployable in a way it's easier without this same level of team involvement in seven other factories. That's the stage we are at. Okay. So let's talk about what you guys learned initially with Project Athena. You started out, you were using cameras, correct, to analyze the defects in wafers. And let's see, there was like 10, I I think it was 10 terabytes of data a day, 17 million photos. There's, There's a lot that was happening. So talk to me exactly about what you guys did and even how you trained your neural network to analyze this data. Yeah, I'll cover this in two parts and make sure I'll hit the second training part as well. First, uh, you got the numbers right in there. So this is that 17 million images is just for that one process where we start with those 200 nanometer wafers. And then through that 1400 steps, we cut them into multiple sliders that are then stacked into drivers. And then the drivers go into the disk assembly there. During the 1400 steps, there are multiple stages where we have electron microscopes located that take pictures. Today, in some of these parts as well, is analyzed by the human operators, the experts who have known these things. 
to look for anomalies. Well, we have complemented this with certain level of rule-based AI as well. I mean, as you know, rule-based AI, you go on to write down all the known anomalies, what it looks like, codify it, pre-program it, and then let, let it run through and then make that a prediction. When it's not able to go through that rule-based AI, then the human operator gets involved. But even with that, we were asking our operators to make close to 20 decisions per second, then it gets way too complicated. So that's where we realized the problem space, the anomalies are not fixed. We can't codify everything. It changes over time and it grows as well. So that created a real ideal space where we can apply machine learning to let it learn the anomaly patterns and then continue to train that every three months as the patterns change so that the model is always up to date for us to use it in a better way to make those uh, predictions there. And then you asked about the, the neural network part there. So let me talk a little bit about it. If you take the image classification, there are many models that are out there. And we are using one of the standard image classification models there. But we did try about 30 different so models to see which one works better for us. And it, again, the people who are trying to replicate it, they need to try their own as well, which models. Our models has about 20 plus layers in it. It's a deep neural network. And it has sophistication to find at the pixel level. You can look at the images and at the pixel level and be able to say if it's a defect or not. So that allows us to find at a very high level of accuracy whether a particular wafer has an anomaly or not. Because the sooner we catch those anomalies, we stop that from going through the process being made into drive heads, which fails in our quality process later, or worse, you ship the drive and then it fails at the customer side, which is data management, all those things. So we help to avoid all those things down the chain by finding those defects much, much earlier in the production process there. Got it. Yay. Finding defects early is is awesome. So what is the underlying architecture that you're using here? Because I, I think that's a lot of data. It's happening in real time. I don't know how fast your wafers come off the manufacturing line or for that particular process. Yeah. But it seems like there's a lot of data processing happening at the edge. So what is it that you're using? What are you calculating? Talk to me. At the high rate, we are processing things like 1 billion test uses, tens of millions of drives a quarter. We actually wanted to focus on process steps much, much earlier rather than trying to improve down the chain quality improvement process. So we have looked at these 17 million or so images that are coming through. And our whole oral process is we can't label all of them. Now look at that one. Even if the supervised learning when you go, it depends on someone looking at all the images, trying to label them, say, this is a good one, this is a bad one. It's not possible. To an extent, we can do that. So we devise our own internal algorithm that can look at these images and then create subsets or segmentation of them. So this could be in the bad set or this could be in the other set. And then use the human interpretation to use some level of sampling from it to say, is this correct? So that, that self-labeling algorithm can be corrected instead of it running in a free loop there. So once we have the kind of training data, we were able to build out a two-step process with the training right there on the edge because 10 terabytes of data per day is not something we can send it over to the cloud. But once we train the models, the inference then happens right there on the manufacturing line, requiring about 20 or so decisions per second while well, this process goes through to make which wafer is good and which wafer is not bad and do so at a high level of confidence so we can end up with a much better quality there. It sounds like you have done a lot of the work already that a lot of companies are trying to figure out. So how did you set this up? Was it easy? Did you have to hire in experts to create this platform? If there existed an off-the-shelf solution, our team would have went and bought it. There would not have been any internal development or anything. Like literally, we were about, the, these are the people who wanted to solve the problem, not just let me go and invent it again here mentality. But when we looked outside something that takes this image analytics and use it to solve anomaly detection, there was none existed. 
So we brought in HP partner, as our partner, and together we were like driving shotgun. Like we are the domain experts with a good understanding of how the machine learning and data science works. And then HP with their edge line servers and having deployed in a similar scale, but something else like an IoT sense and others. Together, the team helped develop an architecture. We wanted a, an easier orchestration where the model gets trained correctly, the model gets deployed easily for inference, and then you have a way to retrain the model and redeploy it over the period. It's not just one undone. It needs to work continuously. So that helped us. Having HP as a partner really helped us build a more maintainable solution that grows over the time. In fact, we are now able to take that one and scale it out to seven other factories there. And then add one more point to it. When we looked, it none existed. So we wanted to share our experience as well. That's one of the reasons why we wrote a white paper defining our problem space as well as our architecture. So we ended up trying two different architectures. The one we initially built out with HP, and then the other one is um, without the HP edge line servers, we did with the DGX, the, the big one from NVIDIA, and used that as a parallel architecture to test this one out. Both those architectures work. One, you end up with a lot more compute than in our case than what we needed, but both of those definitely would work for anyone wanting to build out image-based AI solution in their factories. Also, can people try to think of image analytics as different from IoT, but I'll say this, the most prolific IoT sensor that is out there is a camera lens. And people should start thinking about those camera first use cases a lot more than just looking at, say, a few sensors here and there. Because a camera captures so much more information that is rich, and you can put it to work in ways that we did not even think of. That is true. I am totally on board with the camera being the most important sensor, especially in things like manufacturing and industrial applications. Obviously, it's awesome in homes too, but I have issues with cameras being in everyone's home. Let's go on to, you've obviously done this, but you guys did it a little bit faster than I thought. Three months getting into it and then 12 to 15 actually implementing it. And so your next step is to bring this to all seven of your manufacturing plants and then maybe doing some additional use cases. Talk to me about the next steps. Yeah, we were able to achieve the 12 to 15 months mainly because we defined our goals clearly to one process, one aspect only. We didn't try to go solve, elevate my entire factory, every part of it into smart manufacturing, right? So we focused on let's get this working on one line. So that helped as well. So we did not deviate from it. We did not try to add on one thing or the other as the process went along. So we focused on one thing and achieved that one. Now that we have a solution, we our goal then is we have a timeline. We want to take this one and then replicate it in seven of our factories. This requires a bit of packaging. So as you know, with any of these projects, um, be it an open source or anything else you do, we all focus on solving the problem, not about shipping it or not about how other people would use it, right? So we are now making sure the second aspects come through, where this becomes more of a package solution that our teams can take it and deploy it across the seven other factories there. And in terms of the other use cases, filtered down all the AI and cameras and everything, it came down to what is it we are solving? It came down to its anomaly detection. Is this one fits within the pattern of acceptable range? When we take that distilled that one, then the input doesn't matter. Your environment or the domain doesn't matter. It really comes down to the anomaly detection case, which we see as a lot of potential outside of smart manufacturing. It could be public safety or it could be smart cities or even in an AV case, we see this having a direct application to take this solution and apply. We are now looking at taking some of the models that we built, if it has any direct application in rest of our predictive maintenance and other use cases as well at this point. Got it. We've talked about a lot of the technical stuff. We've even delved into some of the business stuff. But what is your advice to people who are listening to this and they're like, oh, this sounds awesome. I totally want to do it. How should they do this from a people perspective? Number one, we're getting the management on board is really number one. And it's now it's not going and making a pitch that is riddled with AI and machine learning and deep learning jargons in there, but more of focus on what is it we're going to do that's going to move the needle there. 
So our pitch really started with like our quality process is time consuming and long and human intensive and also prone to errors in some cases that are caught much later. We are operating at full capacity and we needed a way to get more out of our existing investments and put forth a solution that helped directly address those business challenges there. And then peel back the layer, then when you say, and we're going to solve this using a machine learning project and make sure that we put in our investment ask. And also we showed an ROI. What do we expect to see by even doing that initial pilot investment that is needed? We actually have initially predicted a 300% return ROI on our initial investment, and we are well on our way on, on to get there. And then the second part is, as I said, is about getting people excited all around, not just that small group that you're working with or your direct execs, to get organizationally telling people, telling the story. That's why we had the brand and be able to tell everyone what's happening with Project Athena and getting them a full view of our progress, as well as sharing with them the initial excitement and the results that we're getting there as well. And then lastly, the question of some people have always asked, like, this whole thing that we even read today, is the AI going to take away all our jobs kind of thing, right? So what we actually find is if we help solve this problem, it actually frees us up to do some of the higher order changes so that we don't need to stand there and look at those particular images. We could be solving way up, improving the production quality and the manufacturing process as well. So overall, starting with the execs, getting in excitement from everyone with proper branding, even if it is internal, you need to do the branding and marketing right, and then getting the buy-in from all the other teams that is involved with numbers rooted in it helped us get there. Excellent. All right. Well, Rags, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I feel smarter, and I think a lot of people will find this really helpful as they embark on their own IoT journey. All right, Stacey, thank you. I enjoy talking to you and sharing with you our experience. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. 